This lecture, The Benevolence of Capitalism, was delivered in August of 2006 in Auburn, Alabama at the Ludwig von Mises Institute's Mises Summer University. Well, my subject, as you know, is the uh, benevolence of capitalism. And what I mean by the benevolence of capitalism is the fact that it promotes human life and well-being and does so for everyone. Uh, many aspects of this benevolence have been developed over more than three centuries by a series of great thinkers from John Locke to Ludwig von Mises and Ayn Rand. And I present as many of them as I can in my book, Capitalism. I'm going to briefly discuss uh, about a dozen or so of these aspects that I consider to be the most important and which I believe, taken all together, make the case for capitalism irresistible. Uh, I'll discuss them roughly in the order in which I present them in my book. And let me say that I apologize for the brevity of my discussions. Each one of these aspects uh, that I go into would all by itself require a discussion longer than the entire time that's been allotted to me to speak today. So fortunately, I can fall back on the fact that in my book, at least, I think I have presented them in the detail they deserve. And now let me begin. And we've got uh, uh, an outline on the board uh, listing the, the main headings. Uh, first, uh, freedom, individual freedom. This, of course, is uh, one of the most essential and fundamental features of capitalism. And it is the foundation of security. It's very common for people uh, to try to claim that there's a conflict between freedom and security. But the reality is that freedom is the, act the actual foundation of security in the sense both of personal safety and economic security. Uh, freedom's the foundation both of personal safety and of economic security. And that follows from its uh, very nature, because what freedom is, is the absence of the initiation of physical force. The absence of the initiation of physical force. So when one is free, one is safe, secure, from common crime. Because what one is free of, or free from, is precisely acts such as assault and battery, robbery, rape, and murder, all of which represent the initiation of physical force. So if freedom is the absence of the initiation of physical force, that implies it's the absence of robbery, rape, murder, etc. And so to the extent we have freedom, uh, we are personally safe, personally secure. Even more important, of course, is that when one is free, one is free from the initiation of physical force on the part of the government, which is potentially far more deadly than that of any private criminal gang. The Gestapo and the KGB, for example, with their enslavement and murder of millions, made private criminals look tame by comparison. The fact that freedom is the absence of the initiation of physical force also means that peace is a corollary of freedom. Where there is freedom, there is peace because there is no use of force. Insofar as force is not initiated, the use of force in defense or retaliation is not required. So this absence of force uh, initi initiated and defensive, this absence of force is precisely the meaning of peace. The economic security provided by freedom <clears throat> derives from the fact that under freedom, everyone can choose to do whatever he judges to be most in his interest to do, without fear of being stopped by the physical force of anyone else so long as he himself does not initiate the use of physical force. This means, for example, that he can take the highest paying job he can find and buy from the most competitive suppliers he can find. At the same time, he can keep all the income he earns and save as much of it as he likes, investing his savings in the most profitable ways he can. The only thing he cannot do is use physical force himself. 
With the use of force prohibited, the way an individual increases the money he earns is by using his reason to figure out how to offer other people more or better goods and services for the same money, since this is the means of inducing them voluntarily to spend more of their funds in buying from him rather than from competitors. Thus, freedom is the basis of everyone being as economically secure as the exercise of his own reason and also the reason of his suppliers can make him. So that is uh, aspect one. Let's turn to two. Uh, 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 the second aspect of the benevolence of capitalism is a continuing increase in the supply of economically usable, accessible natural resources. This is possible as man converts a larger fraction of the virtual infinity that is nature into economic goods and wealth on the foundation both of growing knowledge of nature and growing physical power over it. I discussed this point at uh, considerable length yesterday in my lecture on environmental and resource economics. And uh, if any of you missed that, well, then please, for further elaboration, see uh, chapter three of my book, Capitalism. Uh, let's turn to three, uh, which is that production and economic activity, uh, by their very nature, serve to improve man's environment. We hear endless propaganda nowadays that production and economic activity are destroying the environment. The reality is the exact opposite. And uh, this uh, follows from the fact uh, uh, that from the point of view of physics and chemistry, all that production and economic activity consist of is the rearrangement of the same nature-given chemical elements in different combinations and their movement to different geographical locations. Uh, one of the main points I made yesterday was the entire mass of the Earth from the upper limits of the atmosphere 4,000 miles straight down to the center of the Earth is solidly packed chemical elements. That's what the whole world consists of. That's nature's contribution to natural resources uh, in the planet Earth. And uh, all of our economic and productive activity viewed from the perspective of physics and chemistry uh, consists simply of moving the chemical elements around. We break them out of some combinations, put them into other combinations, and move their locations. And the guiding purpose of this rearrangement and movement is essentially nothing other than to make the chemical elements stand in an improved relationship to human life and well-being. It puts the chemical elements in combinations and locations where they provide greater utility, greater benefit to human beings. Uh, the relationship of the chemical elements iron and copper, for example, to man's life and well-being is greatly improved when they're extracted from beneath the earth and made to appear in such products as automobiles, refrigerators, and electric cable. The relationship of chemical elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen to man's life and well-being is improved when they can be made to yield electric light and power. The relationship of a piece of land to man's life and well-being is improved when instead of his having to sleep upon it in a sleeping bag, and take precautions against snakes, scorpions, and other wildlife, he can sleep in a well-constructed modern home that is built upon it uh, with all the utilities and appliances we take for granted. <clears throat> well, the totality of the chemical elements in their relationship to man constitutes man's external material environment, and precisely this is what production and economic activity serve to improve by their very nature. That we're adapting the environment to ourselves when we move the chemical elements around in these ways, and that's the improvement in the environment. We've made uh, nature as we found it better. Uh, we've adapted it to our needs and wants. So that is uh, aspect three. <coughs> now four, uh, the division of labor, a leading feature of capitalism, uh, which can exist in a highly developed form only under capitalism, provides, among other major benefits, the enormous gains from the multiplication of the amount of knowledge 
that enters into the productive process and a continuing progressive increase in that knowledge. Just consider each distinct occupation, each sub-occupation has its own distinct body of knowledge. In a division of labor capitalist society, there are as many distinct bodies of knowledge entering into the productive process as there are distinct jobs. The totality of this knowledge operates to the benefit of each individual in his capacity as a consumer when he buys the products produced by others. And much or most of it also in his capacity as a producer insofar as his production is aided by the use of capital goods previously produced by others. Thus, a given individual may work as a carpenter, say. His specialized body of knowledge is that of carpentering. But in his capacity as a consumer, he obtains the benefit of all the other distinct occupations throughout the economic system. The existence of such a vast body of knowledge is essential to the very existence of many products. All products that require in their production more knowledge than any one individual or small number of individuals can hold. Such products, of course, include machinery, which uh, sim could simply not exist, could not be produced in the absence of an extensive division of labor and the enormous body of knowledge that it represents. Moreover, uh, in a division of labor capitalist society, a large proportion of the most intelligent and ambitious members of the society, such as geniuses and other individuals of great ability, choose their concentrations precisely in areas that have the effect of progressively improving and increasing the volume of knowledge that is applied in production. This is the effect of such individuals concentrating on areas such as science, invention, and business. Now contrast this with a third world uh, arrangement where virtually everybody is a self-sufficient farmer. Uh, in a third world country, everybody essentially has the same very limited body of knowledge, uh, how to plant rice, tend it, uh, cook it, whatever. And that's the range of the knowledge of production that's uh, entering into the productive process in a third world country. Go to a different country, change the crop, but uh, that's the basic idea. Uh, in a first world division of labor society, the volume of knowledge is the sum of the bodies of knowledge of all the specializations and subspecializations. And then it's dynamic also, because an important aspect of this setup is people engaged in science and, and uh, technology, invention, and business. So the, the body of knowledge is not only immense, but it improves from generation to generation. And everybody, in his capacity as a consumer, gets the benefit of this uh, huge and growing volume of knowledge. All right, let's turn to five. At least since the time of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, it's been known that there's a tendency in a capitalist economy toward an equalization of the rate of profit, or rate of return on capital, across all branches of the economic system. Where rates of return are above average, they provide the incentive and also the means through saving and reinvestment. Uh, for, uh, they provide the incentive and also the means for stepped up investment and thus more production and supply. Where rates of return are above average, they provide the incentive and the means for stepped up investment and thus more production and supply which then operates to reduce prices and the rate of return. Where rates of return are below average, the result is reduced investment and reduced production and supply, followed by a rise in profits and the rate of return. Thus, high rates of profit come down and low rates of profit come up. This is the, the tendency toward a uniform uh, rate of profit or rate of return on capital invested. Now, the operation of this principle not only serves to keep the uh, different branches of a capitalist economy in proper balance with one another, but it also serves to give the consumers the power to determine the relative size of the various industries, simply on the basis of their pattern of buying and abstention from buying, to use the words of Mises. Where the consumers spend more, profits rise, and where they spend less, profits fall. In response to the higher profits, investment and production are increased. And in response to the lower profits or losses, they are decreased. 
Thus, the pattern of investment and production is made to follow the pattern of consumer spending. Perhaps even more importantly, the operation of the tendency toward a uniform rate of return on capital invested serves to bring about a pattern of progressive improvement in products and methods of production. Any given business can earn an above average rate of return by introducing a new or improved product that consumers want to buy, or a more efficient lower cost method of producing an existing product. But then the high profit it enjoys attracts competitors. And once the innovation becomes generally adopted, the high profit disappears, with the result that the consumers gain the full benefit of the innovation. They end up getting better products and paying lower prices. If the firm that made the innovation wants to continue to earn an exceptional rate of profit, it must introduce further innovations, which end up with the same results. Earning a high rate of profit for a prolonged period of time requires the introduction of a continuing series of innovations, with the consumers obtaining the full benefit of all of the innovations up to the most recent ones. Well, there's actually quite a bit under five. I, I touched on them all. I didn't uh, coordinate the, the outline, though. All right, let's uh, go to six. As uh, Mises has shown in a market economy, which of course is what capitalism is, private ownership of the means of production operates to the benefit of everyone, non-owners as well as owners. And this has to be stressed as strongly as possible. You don't need to be a capitalist to get the benefit of capitalism. You don't have to be an owner of the means of production to get the benefit of the means of production or of the capitalist system. The non-owners of the means of production obtain the benefit of the means of production owned by other people. They obtain this benefit as and when they buy the products of those means of production. To get the benefit of General Motors factories and their equipment, or the benefit of Exxon's oil fields, pipelines, and refineries, I do not have to be a stockholder or a bondholder in those firms. I merely have to be in a position to buy an automobile or gasoline or whatever that they produce. Moreover, thanks to the dynamic, progressive aspect of the uniformity of rate of profit or rate of return principle that I explained a moment ago, the general benefit from, from privately owned means of production to the non-owners continually increases as they are enabled to buy ever more and better products at progressively falling real prices. Now seven, a corollary of the general benefit from private ownership of the means of production is the general benefit from the institution of inheritance. The usual view is that the only people who gain from inheritance are those lucky enough to be heirs. Well, the reality is that not only heirs, but also non-heirs benefit from the existence of the institution of inheritance. The non-heirs benefit because the institution of inheritance encourages saving and capital accumulation to the extent that it leads people to accumulate and maintain capital for transmission to their heirs. The result of the existence of this extra accumulated capital is more means of production producing for the market and thus more and better products for everyone to buy. Uh, the effect of additional capital, of course, is also an additional demand for labor, and thus higher wage rates. The demand for labor, it should be realized, is a major means by which all privately owned means of production operate to the benefit of non-owners. Capital underlies the demand for labor as well as the supply of products. Eight, uh, under capitalism, not only is one man's gain not another man's loss, insofar as it comes out of an increase in overall total production, but also, in the most important cases, 
namely those of the building of great industrial fortunes, one man's gain is positively other men's gain. This follows from the sheer arithmetical requirements of building a great fortune, follows from the fact that the sheer arithmetical requirements of building a great fortune are a combination of the earning of a high rate of profit on capital for a prolonged period of time and the saving and reinvestment of the far greater part of the profits earned year after year. I just think from the point of view purely of uh, financial arithmetic, uh, suppose you were to start with some given sum such as uh, $100,000 and uh, the objective is to run the 100,000 into a billion at the end of so many years. Well, to do that implies you have to have a certain compound annual rate of growth. Uh, I don't know exactly what it might be, uh, maybe 50% for 40 years, uh, one to the uh, 1.5 to the 40th, uh, maybe that's a sufficient multiple. Uh, there is some uh, compound annual rate of growth. And this compound annual rate of growth in the fortune uh, comes out of a high rate of profit. If you are earning a 2% rate of profit, obviously that's not enough. If you're earning a 60 or 70% rate of profit and we're consuming it all, you're not going to grow. You have to have the combination of a high rate of profit and very heavy saving out of that profit. That will give you uh, the necessary compound rate of growth to build the fortune. Well, as we have seen uh, a few minutes ago, the earning of a high rate of profit for a prolonged period of time in the face of competition requires the introduction of a series of significant innovations. These innovations represent better and less expensive products for the consumers. The saving and reinvestment of the profits earned on the innovations constitute the accumulation of means of production, which also serves the consumers. Thus, both in their origin, in high profits, and in their disposition, in the accumulation of capital, great industrial fortunes represent corresponding gains to the general consuming public. For example, old Henry Ford, uh, starting with a capital of $25,000 in 1903 and ending with a capital of a billion dollars in 1946, was the other side of the coin of the average person becoming enabled to buy a greatly improved, far more efficiently produced automobile, produced largely in factories representing Ford's billion. So uh, Ford's gain of a billion was the gain of the average person uh, having a much better, uh, more affordable automobile. And that applies also uh, to an important extent uh, to the people who bought the cars of competitors because uh, Ford's performance played a role in their improvement too. Nine. As Mises has shown, the economic competition that takes place under capitalism is, a, is radically different than the biological competition that prevails in the animal kingdom. In fact, its character is diametrically opposite. It's totally wrong uh, the way people characterize competition as the rat race, dog eat dog, survival of the fittest. Uh, the animal species are confronted with scarce nature-given means of subsistence whose supply they are unable to increase. Man, by virtue of his possession of reason, can increase the supply of everything on which his survival and well-being depend. Thus, instead of the biological competition of animals striving to grab off limited supplies of nature-given necessities, with the strong succeeding and the weak perishing, economic competition under capitalism is a competition in who can increase the supply of things the most, with the outcome being practically everyone surviving longer and better. Totally unlike lions in the jungle who must compete for a limited supply of animals, such as zebras and gazelles, by means of the power of their senses and limbs, 
Producers under capitalism are in competition for a limited supply of dollars in the hands of consumers, which they compete for by means of offering the best and most economical products their minds can devise. Since such competition is a competition in the positive creation of new and additional wealth, there are no genuine long-run losers as the result of it. There are only winners. The competition of farmers and farm equipment manufacturers enables the hungry and weak to eat and grow strong. That of pharmaceutical manufacturers enables the sick to recover their health. That of eyeglass and hearing aid manufacturers enables many who otherwise could not see or hear to do so. So far from being a competition whose outcome is the survival of the fittest, the competition of capitalism is more accurately described as a competition whose outcome is the survival of all, or at least of more and more for longer and ever better. Longer and longer and ever better. The only sense in which only the fittest survive is that it is the fittest products and the fittest methods of production that survive until replaced by still fitter products and methods of production with the effects on human survival just described. As Mises has also shown with his development of Ricardo's law of comparative advantage into the law of association, there is room for all in the competition of capitalism. Even those less capable than others in every respect have a place. In fact, in large measure, under capitalism, so far uh, from being a matter of conflict among human beings, so far from competition being a matter of conflict among human beings, it is actually a process of organizing that one great system of social cooperation known as the division of labor. Competition is not a, a matter of conflict, it's a process of organizing social cooperation. That's its actual nature. It decides at what point in this all-embracing system of social cooperation each individual will make his specific contribution. Who, for example, and for how long, will be captain of industry and who will be a janitor and who will fill all the positions in between. In this competition, each individual, however limited his abilities, is enabled to outcompete all others, however superior to him in their abilities they may be, for his special place. Quite literally, and as an everyday occurrence, those with abilities no greater than required to be a janitor are able to outcompete, hands down, without question, the world's greatest productive geniuses for the job of janitor. For example, Bill Gates uh, might be so superior an individual that in addition to being able to revolutionize the software industry, he might be able to clean five times as many square feet of office space in the same time as any janitor now living and do it better. But if Gates can earn a million dollars an hour running Microsoft and janitors can be found willing to work for, say, $10 an hour, their readiness to perform the job at one one hundred thousandth of the hourly rate Gates would require so far dwarfs their lesser abilities that it is they who are hors de concours in this case. There's no contest. They automatically beat Gates hands down uh, in the competition for the job of janitor. At the same time, because productive geniuses are free to succeed in revolutionizing products and methods of production, those with abilities no greater than required to be janitors are able to enjoy not only food, clothing, and shelter, but even such products as automobiles, television sets, and personal computers, products whose very existence they could probably never have even dreamed of on their own. The losses associated with competition are at most short-run losses only. For example, once the blacksmiths and horse breeders put out of business by the automobile found other lines of work on a comparable level, the only lasting effect of the automobile on them was that they too, in their capacity as consumers, came to enjoy the advantages of the automobile over the horse. 
Similarly, farmers using mules who were driven out of business by the competition of farmers using tractors did not die of starvation, but simply had to change their line of work. And when they did so, they, along with everyone else, enjoyed both a more abundant supply of food and of other products as well. Which other products could be produced precisely on the foundation of the labor released from agriculture? Even in those cases, in which an isolated competition results in an individual having to spend the remainder of his life at a lower station in life than he enjoyed before. For example, the owner of a buggy whip factory having to live for the rest of his life as an ordinary wage earner after being put out of business by the automobile. Even he cannot reasonably claim that competition has harmed him. The most he can reasonably claim is that from this point on, the immense gains he derives from competition are less than the still more immense gains he derived from it previously. For competition is what underlies the production and supply of everything he continues to be able to buy, and is what is responsible for the purchasing power of every dollar of his and everyone else's income. And of course, it proceeds to raise his real income from the level to which it was set back. Indeed, under capitalism, competition proceeds to raise the standard of living of the average wage earner above that even of the very wealthiest people in the world a few generations earlier. Today, for example, the average wage earner in a capitalist country has a standard of living higher than that even of Queen Victoria in probably every respect except the ability to employ servants. Well, I don't have time to elaborate this point. The enemies of competition as the true advocates of the law of the jungle but uh, if anyone is interested, I, I do discuss it in capitalism. 10, and now once more with credit to Mises, uh, so far from being the planless chaos and anarchy of production that is alleged by Marxists, capitalism is in actuality as thoroughly and rationally planned an economic system as it is possible to have. The planning that goes on under capitalism, without hardly ever being recognized as such, is the planning of each individual participant in the economic system. Every individual who thinks about a course of economic activity that would be a benefit to him and how to carry it out is engaged in economic planning. Individuals plan to buy homes, automobiles, appliances, and indeed even groceries. They plan what jobs to train for and where to offer and apply the abilities they possess. Business firms plan to introduce new products or discontinue existing products. They plan to change their methods of production or continue to use the methods they presently use. They plan to open branches or close branches. They plan to hire new workers or lay off workers they presently employ. They plan to add to their inventories or reduce their inventories. Well, still more examples of routine, everyday economic planning by private individuals and businesses could be found. Private economic planning is everywhere around us and everyone engages in it. But to everyone except students of Mises, it is invisible. To those who are ignorant of Mises, economic planning is the province of government. This is a, quite a remarkable situation that here we have this planning going on and it's totally ignored and dismissed as people running around like chickens without heads. That's the, uh, the view of today's intellectuals. And the only people who are thinking and planning are the Clintons in a White House conference or uh, their successor. Uh, only the, uh, the government officials are planning uh, the citizens. Uh, their mental activities count for nothing. Well, immense, all-pervasive private economic planning not only exists, but it is also all coordinated, integrated, harmonized to produce a cohesively planned economic system. The means by which this is accomplished is the price system. All of the economic planning of private individuals and business firms 
takes place on the basis of a consideration of prices. Prices constituting costs and prices constituting revenue or income. Individuals planning to buy goods or services of any kind always consider the prices of those goods and services and are prepared to change their plans in the face of price changes. Individuals planning to sell goods or services always consider the prices they can expect uh, to obtain for their goods or services and are also prepared to change their plans in the face of price changes. Business firms, of course, base their plans on a consideration both of sales revenues and of costs, and thus of the respective prices constituting both, and are prepared to change their plans in response to changes in profitability. Thus, for example, when my wife and I first moved to California, our housing plan was to purchase a house high on a hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean. But after learning the price of such houses, we quickly decided that we needed to revise our housing plan and look for a house several miles inland instead. In this way, we were led to change our housing plan in a way that made it harmonize with the plans of other people who also planned to buy the kind of houses we were originally planning to buy, but in addition were willing and able to commit to their plan more money than we were willing and able to commit to ours. The higher bids of others and our consideration of those bids brought about a harmonization of our housing plan with theirs. Similarly, a naive college freshman might have a career plan that calls for him to major in medieval French literature or Renaissance poetry. <laughs> but uh, sometime before the start of his junior year, he comes to realize that if he persists in such a career plan, he can expect to live his life starving in a garret. <laughs> On the other hand, if he changes his career plan and majors in a field such as accounting or engineering, he can expect to live very comfortably. And so he changes his career plan and major. In changing his career plan on the basis of a consideration of prospective income, the student is making a change that better accords with the plans of others in the economic system. Uh, for execution of the plans of others requires the services of far more accountants and engineers than it does the services of literary experts. Uh, so the student didn't know this, but that's the reality. He he's, knows he's changing his plan, but the fact that he's doing it in response to a consideration of income is making him change his plan in a way that coordinates it with other people's plans in the economy. A last example. Uh, consumers change their dietary plan, and thus plans say to eat more fish and chicken and less red meat, a change I personally don't approve of. <laughs> uh, this results in a corresponding change in their pattern of buying and abstention from buying. Now, in order to maintain their profitability, supermarkets and restaurants must plan to change their offerings, namely to increase the respective quantities of fish and chicken and fish and chicken entrees or sandwiches they supply and decrease the quantities of red meat and red meat entrees or sandwiches they supply. These plan changes and corresponding purchase changes on the part of supermarkets and restaurants result in further plan changes and purchase changes on the part of their suppliers and on the part of their suppliers' suppliers and so on until the entire economic system has been sufficiently replanned to accord with the change in the plans and purchases of the consumers. The price system and the consideration of cost and revenue that it entails on the part of all individuals leads to the economic system continually being replanned in response to changes in demand and supply in a way that minimizes that maximizes gains, that maximizes gains and minimizes losses, and ensures that each individual process of production is carried on in a way that is maximally conducive to production in the rest of the economic system. For example, as the result of a decrease in the supply of crude oil, there will be a rise in the price of crude oil and oil products. All individual buyers will consider the higher prices in relation to their own specific circumstances. In the case of consumers, their needs and desires. 
In the case of business firms, their ability to pass along the increase to customers. And all of them will consider the alternatives to the use of oil or oil products available to them specifically. Thus, on the basis of his individual thinking and planning, each of the participants will reduce his demand for the items in a way that least impairs his well-being. And in this way, the thinking and planning of all participants in the economic system who use oil or oil products will enter into the determination of where and by how much the quantity of oil and oil products demanded decreases in response to a rise in their price. This is clearly an instance of responding to a loss of supply in a way that minimizes the impact of the loss. The reduction in supply will be accompanied by an equivalent reduction in its use in the least important of the employments for which the previously larger supply had been sufficient. Similarly, the price system and the individual thinking and planning of all participants leads to the maximization of the gains from an increase in the supply of any scarce factor of production. The additional supply is absorbed in those lines in which it is most highly valued, that is, in which it could be absorbed with the least fall in price. Well, ironically, while capitalism is an economic system that is thoroughly and rationally planned and continuously replanned in response to changes in economic conditions, socialism, as Mises has shown, is incapable of rational economic planning. In destroying the price system and its foundations, namely private ownership of the means of production, the profit motive and competition, socialism destroys the intellectual division of labor that is essential to rational economic planning. It makes the impossible demand that the planning of the economic system be carried out as an indivisible whole in a single mind that only an omniscient deity could possess. That's what socialism requires. What socialism represents is so far from rational economic planning that it is actually the prohibition of rational economic planning. In the first instance, by its very nature, it is a prohibition of economic planning by everyone except the dictator and the other members of the central planning board. They are to enjoy a monopoly privilege on planning in the absurd, virtually insane belief that their brains can achieve the all-seeing, all-knowing capabilities of omniscient deities. They cannot. Thus, what socialism actually represents is the attempt to substitute the thinking and planning of one man, or at most a mere handful of men, for the thinking and planning of tens and hundreds of millions, indeed billions of men. By its nature, the attempt to make the brains of so few meet the needs of so many has no more prospect of success than would an attempt to make the legs of so few the vehicle for carrying the weight of so many. That's really the essence of socialism. They think we don't need the brains of the masses of the, of the people. All we need are the brains of the dictator and the central planning board, and that should do it. They think uh, the human mind is uh, a worthless organ uh, uh, if it's not possessed uh, by the dictator and his cronies. Well, that's why uh, they had a big surprise. At right, 11, I turn now to the subject of monopoly. Uh, socialism is the system of monopoly. As you could just see, it's monopolizing economic planning. Uh, capitalism is the system of freedom and free competition. As Mises pointed out, the essential nature-given requirements of human life, such as drinking water, arable land, and the accessible supplies of practically all minerals, are typically available in quantities so great that not all available sources can be exploited. The labor that would be required is not available. Uh, it is employed on pieces of land and mineral deposits that are more productive, or in the numerous operations of manufacturing and commerce where its employment is demonstrated by market prices to be more important than the production of an additional supply of agricultural commodities or minerals. In these conditions, and in the absence of government interference, 
what is required to enable any producer or combination of producers to become the sole supplier of anything is that the price he charges is too low to make it worthwhile for other potential suppliers to enter the field. The position of sole supplier is secured by lowness of price and not the basis for imposing a high price. It is not the basis for imposing a high price. The same essential point applies to cases in which the necessity of investing large sums of capital sharply limits the number of suppliers, such as opening a, uh, an efficient-sized automobile factory. Uh, economists routinely complain it takes $2 billion or more, perhaps, to have an efficient-sized automobile factory. I only have 100,000, so I can't compete. Well, what they're not realizing is that the, the large capital is required uh, in order to achieve low unit costs of production, which are necessary in order to be profitable at low selling prices. If the prices were not going to be low commensurate with these low costs, to the extent that they would be higher, uh, you could make money with higher costs. And if you can have higher costs, you don't need uh, that much capital. In order for large capital to actually represent a competitive advantage, keeping uh, others with less capital out, it has to be used uh, to charge lower prices. Well, monopoly is actually the result of government intervention. Uh, specifically, it's the reservation of a market or part of a market to one or more suppliers by means of the initiation of physical force exclusive government franchises, protective tariffs, and licensing laws are examples. Twelve, capitalism is a system of progressively rising real wages, the shortening of hours, and the improvement of working conditions. Contrary to Adam Smith and Karl Marx, uh, businessmen and capitalists do not deduct profits from what allegedly was originally all wages or what allegedly is naturally and rightfully all wages. That was their starting point. And then uh, Marx developed the whole exploitation theory to uh, explain the extent of this alleged deduction of profits from wages. That's the mentality of the unions. They think whatever profits are earned are earned as a deduction from what naturally and rightfully belongs to them as, uh, as wages. Well, it turns out, if you seriously analyze the situation, the original and primary form of income is profit, not wages. Uh, if we look at the examples given by Smith and Marx, they imagine there are manual workers producing and selling commodities, say shoes, bread, or whatever. Uh, Marx uh, uh, described what he called simple circulation. Adam Smith talked of the early and rude state of society, uh, where workers are, are just producing products, uh, selling them, uh, but there are no capitalists yet. And they assumed that uh, the income these workers earned were somehow wages. Well, the reality is, if you're selling a pair of shoes or a loaf of bread, the, what you are paid is not a wage, it's a sales revenue, a product sales revenue. And precisely because those manual workers did not behave as capitalists, did not buy for the sake of selling, but simply uh, made expenditures as consumers, because they didn't buy for the sake of selling, uh, they did not have any money costs of production. Money costs of production result from having expended money for the purpose of bringing in sales. If no expenditures are made for the purpose of bringing in sales, there's no money costs of production. Uh, take a simple example. Suppose someone is selling something for $100. Now imagine that he's had to spend $90 to produce the item that he sells for $100. Okay, his cost would be 90, his profit would be 10. If he only spent $9 to produce what he sells for 100, then his cost is 9, his profit is 91. If he only spent 90 cents and sold something for 100, his profit would be $99.10. If he spent zero and sold for 
uh, the entire sales proceeds would be profit. That's the situation of the manual workers in Smith's early and rude state of society and Marx's simple circulation. So the, it's only workers who are getting incomes, but the nature of the incomes they're getting is profit, not wages. Well, uh, when uh, do wages appear? Well, contrary to Smith and Marx, it's only with the coming of capitalists and the accumulation of capital that the phenomenon of wages comes into existence along with the demand for capital goods. Both wages and the expenditure for capital goods show up as money costs of production which must be deducted from sales revenues. The more economically capitalistic the economic system, in the sense of the greater is the buying for the purpose of earning sales revenues relative to the sales revenues, the higher are wages and other costs relative to sales revenues, and thus the lower are profits relative both to sales revenues and to wages. In other words, what capitalists are responsible for is not the phenomenon of profit and its deduction from wages, but the creation of the phenomena of wages and money costs and their deduction from sales revenues, which were originally all profits. Capitalists are responsible for the creation of wages and the reduction of the proportion of sales revenues that represent profits. The more numerous and wealthier our capitalists, the higher our wages relative to profits. Uh, for elaboration, uh, I refer you to uh, chapter 11 in my book. Now, the fact that uh, this is another major aspect of uh, wages and uh, misconceptions about it, uh, the fact that wage earners may be willing to work for minimum subsistence in the absence of any better alternative, and that businessmen and capitalists, like any other buyer, prefer to pay less rather than more, uh, these are true propositions, but they're utterly irrelevant to the determination of the wages that the workers must actually accept. Those wages are determined by the competition of employers for labor, which is both the most fundamental useful element in the economic system and is intrinsically scarce. Uh, let me try to take a simple example. Uh, suppose we have uh, these uh, two gentlemen here at the end. Uh, the one on my left is uh, able and willing uh, to pay uh, $1,000 for this wonderful uh, voice recorder. The gentleman on my right over there is able and willing to pay 2000 Now, he'd rather pay 200 than 2000 better still 20 than 200 Suppose uh, because he wants to pay less rather than more, he were to insist on bidding no more than 200 What would be the effect? It's an auction. The other guy would outbid him. He'd be outbid. Now, is that the outcome he wants? No, his actual self-interest is not to pay the least that he would like, but to pay the least that is simultaneously too high for his nearest competitor, in this case, 1,001. And that's the situation of employers. Employers would rather uh, pay less than more, but if it means they can't get the labor they want, it's to their self-interest to raise the bid. Now, in the same way, uh, workers might be willing to work for minimum subsistence. Uh, take a different example. Uh, suppose you have a, a beautiful grand piano, this Bosendorfer, I would pronounce that rightly. Uh, and now imagine the Mises Institute uh, falls on hard times. They have to move to much smaller quarters. Uh, they have to have more than, they can't just have a piano. They're gonna have to get rid of the piano. No question about it, the piano must go. How little, if they had no better alternative, would they be willing to sell that piano for? Well, if no one is coming to buy it, uh, they might be reduced to calling up uh, some wrecker or whatever, haul it to the dump, if there were no alternative. Now, they're willing to give the thing away for free or pay to have it taken off their hands if necessary. Is it likely that they'll have to, uh, to settle for such a low price? So long as there are people around who like such a piano, 
uh, th their competition for the scarce supply is going to determine a price above uh, what the Mises Institute would be willing to sell for. Well, it's the same in the labor market. It might be that the workers are willing to work for minimum subsistence, but that becomes irrelevant to the extent that their labor is useful and scarce and employers are in competition for it. Uh, then the wage the workers have to accept is a wage that is high enough to limit the quantity demanded to the supply available. And that's to the self-interest of employers. And I say, uh, in this competition, it's against the self-interest of any employer to allow wage rates to go below the point corresponding to the full employment of the kind of labor in question, in the location in question. Such low wage rates mean the quantity of labor demanded exceeds the supply available, that there's a shortage of the labor concerned. A shortage is comparable to an auction where there are still two or more bidders for one and the same item. The only way that the bidder who wants the item the most can secure it is by outbidding his rivals and making the item too expensive for them so that they must step aside and make it possible for him to secure the item. In the labor market, there may be tens or even hundreds of millions of workers, but the scarcity of labor means that there are potential jobs for far more than that number. The fact that each of us would like the benefit of the labor of at least 10 others can be taken as an indication of the extent of the scarcity of labor. When a wage rate goes below the point corresponding to the full employment of the kind of labor concerned, it becomes possible for employers not able or willing to pay that higher rate to obtain labor at the expense of other employers who are able and willing to pay the higher rate. The situation is exactly the same as the stronger bidder at an auction who is faced with the loss of the item he wants to a weaker bidder. A price of less than $1,000 is against the interest of this gentleman at the uh, far right, of my far right. The way to secure the labor he needs is to raise the bidding and knock out the competition of the weaker employers. Uh, in the face of labor shortages, which appear when ceiling prices are imposed on labor, employers actually conspire with their employees to evade the spirit of the wage controls by giving out phony promotions. This enables them to claim they're not violating the controls when in fact they are. Now, given the height of money wages, uh, which we have seen is determined by the competition of employers for scarce labor, what determines real wages, i.e. the goods and services that the wage earners can buy with the money they earn, is prices. Uh, real wages are determined fully as much by prices as they are by wages. Real wages can rise only when prices fall relative to wages. And what makes uh, prices fall relative to wages is a rise in the productivity of labor, the output per unit of labor. A rise in the productivity of labor means a larger supply of consumers' goods relative to the supply of labor and thus lower prices of consumers' goods relative to wage rates. If we could somehow measure the supply of consumers' goods, a doubling of the productivity of labor would operate to double the supply of consumers' goods relative to the supply of labor, and in the face of the same overall expenditures to buy consumers' goods and pay wages, uh, would result in a halving of prices uh, relative to wage rates. In other words, it would double real wages. Double the productivity of labor, and you double the supply of consumers' goods relative to labor. If the same spending to buy consumers' goods is going on, the same spending to pay wages, the prices fall in half while wages stay the same. Real wages are doubled. The rise in the productivity of labor is always the essential element in the rise in real wages. It's what enables increases in the quantity of money and volume of spending, which are responsible for higher average money wages. It's what enables that to be accompanied by prices that do not rise, or do not rise to the same extent as wages. And what's responsible for the rise in the productivity of labor is the activities of businessmen and capitalists. Their progressive innovations and capital accumulation underlie the rise in the productivity of labor and thus in real wages. Now, I make no attempt uh, to deal with uh, point 13. I don't know how we've used this much time. Uh, I really thought I would uh, finish in 45 minutes, but I guess I interjected uh, things not in my text here and there, and that's what did it. 
Uh, I'll be glad to stay uh, a little while longer if we're not thrown out of here. If anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. And if you can't get to me now, I'm around here for the next few days, uh, buttonhole me. So, anyone have anything to ask? Yes, sir. Well, on the uh, number 12, where you mentioned about the shortening of hours. Yeah. Um, as much as we're more capitalist than many of the European countries, yeah. how come our hours can be higher? I mean, why are our hours higher? Uh, I would expect the uh, answer is probably uh, they've reduced hours uh, by law to a greater extent. Uh, let me just make the connection on this, how a rise in real wages, how, how the, the, the working day shortens in a free market. If you grant that it's the rise in the productivity of labor that raises real wages, by reducing prices relative to wages. As real wages rise, more and more people are in a position to afford to work shorter hours. Now you'll always make more other things equal working longer hours, but if you can make a lot, uh, if you can make now five times subsistence, you might decide, well, I prefer 60% uh, of five times subsistence uh, to going on with the old rate. And now, as we have a large number of workers preferring shorter hours, uh, they'll be willing to accept shorter hours at wage rates that are lower by more than the hours are shorter. They'll take a discount. See, anytime anyone wants a job of a certain type, suppose uh, people prefer uh, to be park rangers or whatever. They love the outdoors. What's that going to do to the wage rates of park rangers or any job that has some special uh, attraction to it? It operates to lower it, right? Well, if people want shorter hours in large numbers, the market builds in a discount on the shorter hours, which implies a premium on the longer hours. And what's that do to the profitability of offering shorter hours? It makes it profitable to do it. This is how the market shortens the working day, as a byproduct of uh, the rise in real wages. Yes, sir. Um. For your, of your first, your first um, argument about freedom and economic security, yeah. uh, um, I would like you to, to elaborate on the concept of, of economic security because when you when you're thinking about economic security, the concept of economic security um, intuitively can mean that one has a kind of guaranteed, more or less guaranteed. Income. I know that's not, not what you've, you've told us, but I think that the word economic security conveys a certain sense of guaranteed income that I don't know if <laughs> perhaps well, I don't know. Okay, I would say what uh, what economic security ultimately means is uh, the ability to have access to goods. So that if you're hungry, the ability to get food, if it's uh, raining and cold, uh, your ability to have shelter, and that really does not depend on acts of government. It depends on the ability to produce these things. And uh, you have the greatest ability to produce them where there's the greatest freedom. Now, uh, the government might say, well, we're guaranteeing everybody a shelter, and the shelter they'll be lucky to guarantee is a place in a cave somewhere. So uh, the government cannot decree the goods into existence. And it's a kind of uh, irony that uh, people want a, a false security that cannot be provided, and they're making impossible the genuine security they could have uh, based on more production. And, uh, yes? Like social security. Uh, social, see, who is secure with social security? Uh, instead of having your own savings, uh, your security depends on the votes of, the, of Congress uh, in the period of your retirement. And the country is poorer because uh, people, instead of having their own savings, which would have meant a lot more capital in the economy, that uh, what would have been saved has been dissipated in financing government consumption. And one last point on this with competition. People think competition is a terrible threat to security. You could lose your job. Uh, imagine the competition costs you your job. 
Well, what do you need from that point on? You have to find another job. What will make your life easier? If the economy is wide open to competition, so you can find another job anywhere you, where you might be qualified, or if the economy is more and more tied up against competition, where in order to get a job you have to belong to this, that, or the other union, have this, that, or the other license, where is it easier to recover from the loss of a job? In a fully free economy or in a controlled economy? in a fully free economy, but it becomes a self-destructive uh, process. As you introduce controls, you raise the costs of losing a competition, and then people want further protection. If you have a fully controlled economy, and all avenue, all alternatives are closed to you, and now you lose your job, you're threatened with death by starvation. But the solution is not more controls, the solution is abolishing all the controls. Uh, then people can have the security of knowing they could find another job. Yes, last question. Just a, a quick sort of philosophical note. Yeah. Uh, the, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, those who prefer security to uh, freedom deserve neither. Uh, Comment on that phrase. I mean, what do you think about that? In well, if, if one means security, the government giving you some kind of guarantee, then I would agree with Franklin. But if one understands security as I was using the term, I would say uh, you don't have to choose. Freedom gives you all of the rational security that it's possible to have. Well, I thank you very much. I